Hello, this is Christine Eck, and I am the director of the Center for Sacred Window Studies. And I'm so happy to be here today with Julia Jones, who is the founder of Newborn Mothers. Uh, Newborn Mothers is an online program for um, teaching um, postpartum doulas. Julia, I'm going to let you describe your program a little bit, um, but Julia is based in Western Australia, and it's such a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you so much for weathering the time difference and doing an interview. My pleasure. I'm just, I just realized it's a bit glary. You've got nice, like, dim lighting, and mine's a bit bright. So it's nighttime here, which is why my lighting's really bright, because it's actually dark outside. <laughs> yeah, that's better. Um, yeah, so I teach now all over the world. We have 600 students in 30 different countries, which is um, Christine and I were just talking about the amazing opportunity we have these days with the internet um, to share this kind of wisdom. Um, and, yeah, we both met through studying with Isha Oaks, um, also online, which is another one of those little miracles. And now I've taken, you know, like I learned about Ayurveda and postpartum from Isha. I built on that with a whole lot of stuff to do with um, brain science, anthropology, evolution, um, traditional cultures, uh, traditional medicine from other cultures. And um, it, it was really what I was looking for for so many years when I was just looking around at mums. I actually started this work before I had children myself, but I was looking around at other mums and going, this just isn't working. There's something really not right here. Like, what are we missing? And you know, when I started to study doula studies myself, myself, I was finding they were really focusing on like uh, quite simple parenting techniques and breastfeeding, how to breastfeed and maybe some sleep stuff. And I'm like, this isn't really answering that bigger social question of why are new mums so overwhelmed and exhausted? Why do we feel so guilty and ashamed? Why are we so disrespected and unsupported? Ordered, you know like what's what's really going on here and also what's happening because I knew from um, particularly after I had my own babies but I knew from my experience as well as my friends and my clients experiences that having a baby changes you from the inside out I knew that but I couldn't find anyone talking about that um, so anyway, I pulled all this stuff together and that's what newborn mothers is all about. It's, um, it's the concept that when a baby is born, so is a mother and looking at um, how we can better support mums to be the mum that they want to be. It's so beautiful to have this type of education available to enhance um, people who are already doulas or people who are in the caregiving uh, profession as it is to be able to add a, a deeper perspective onto their training and how they work with families um, because there is clearly something that is so um, amiss and and lacking in how this period of time is um, is helped by community as a whole um, so yeah what you're doing is amazing and to have you know people all over the world have the opportunity to uh, learn together particularly to build connections um, with other caregivers doing this kind of thing um, it's truly miraculous and i'm so happy to be a part of it with you and the greater scheme um, yes yeah it's amazing I would love to ask you a little bit to talk about and to open up a discussion about, um, you know, you've talked about um, traditions, like cultural traditions from around the world. And I think we see a lot of synchronicity in the types of uh, practices that those traditions offer for postpartum care. Um, but a thing that I've been thinking about a lot recently is like, where did the shift happen where those traditions stopped happening and I would love to open up a discussion with you about how we've lost some of those traditions in the first place yeah it's a really good question because obviously I came through this not through my own culture but through exploring another culture which was Indian um, culture through Ayurveda so you know that was sort of my first little window into this world but then when i started looking around more i was like oh they do the same thing in china and they do the same thing in africa 
and they do the same thing in Europe and they do the same thing in, in Indigenous Australia. Oh, actually, they do this everywhere. They do the same thing everywhere. And that really blew my mind. I was like, where, where do we go wrong? You know, why aren't we doing this anymore? Um, and I think, I think this is where a lot of people don't realise that it's just a matter of how long ago we lost those traditions. So um, for me, being from European ancestry, it would have been back during the, the witch burnings, you know, when the patriarchy rose and the, witch were, the witches were burned, you know, and the, the women's knowledge, which was all oral, um, particularly because it was really an apprenticeship kind of system. You had to be initiated into this kinds of wisdom. A lot of the healing, you know, herbal um, medicine kind of stuff would have been something you had to really earn the right to know. Um, so, it was, you know, and, and in a way, oral knowledge has a great power in that way, but, it, but it also when it does get destroyed, there's no record. It's hard to find that record. So I think Europeans lost it probably a little bit earlier than some other parts of the world. But then we colonised the rest of the world and that's when we destroyed it for um, everyone else, you know. So, it, it, you know, here in Australia until just a couple of hundred years ago, um, Aboriginal women would have been practising all of these things. And I've interviewed some Noongar elders where I live. I live in, um, it's called Wajrat Noongar country here in Fremantle. Um, and, and a lot of what they've told me is very similar to what everyone else in the world does. And that they were an, a country, a, a culture that was isolated from other humans for many tens of thousands of years and yet still have this same knowledge. It's really blows my mind how human it is, how universal it is. Um, anyway, so as we colonised, as we globalised, as we industrialised, we not only lost our own culture as Europeans, but then we went and destroyed the other cultural traditions as well. And really, I think ultimately it just comes down to the, the, the combination, the patriarchy, colonization, globalization, industrialization. Um, and specifically in terms of losing the village, I think that's happened very recently um, with the industrial age, because as we moved away from our families to have our babies, we didn't have our grandmothers, our aunts, we didn't have the kind of support both the practical support as well as the knowledge that oral tradition we didn't have that lineage of women anymore to call upon. Um, and, and so we had to find another way. And the way we found was control crying and formula feeding and routines. And, you know, those things replaced what would have originally been hands on the woman you know support for that woman to be able to do this incredible job that was never designed to be done by one woman alone right right it is so fascinating to sort of backtrack and really look at the the situations in history that have happened to to create the results of what we see today in this um huge wide open gaping space and caregiving and um and I think really the only way to be able to um, change the pattern is to be able to like process it. We think of like digestion on like a physical, emotional, spiritual, historical level too, and like digest what happened, own what happened, and then start recognizing how, how some things can be different and how we can shift larger change again back to the way that it should be. Yeah, I love that so much. And you know what it makes me think as well is a lot of so many, I just can't even tell you, so many individual women come to me and even after I tell them these these stories and, and even the facts, you know, the statistics, they still say, but, you know, I thought I was the only one. Like, it, is this really like I thought everyone else was coping and, and I was ashamed because I didn't know what was wrong with me, you know. I think we have to stop this idea of being isolated and independent and, you know, that's not, independence is not the goal. The goal is, is community and, um, and connection and, you know, and that's part of processing that is we have to overcome that, that shame that we've been given um, and to a point where we can reflect on this and look at the deeper causes and, and I agree, tell those stories and, and make that change, not on an individual level, but on a cultural level. Yeah, yeah, it is. And I, I think that um, it is bound to begin to shift because 
everybody's saying the same thing. Everybody mm-hmm. is recognizing the same, the same obvious uh, need. Yeah, you know, in the 10 years that I've been doing this work, it's changed a lot. When I first started doing this work, there was no other training in my town. No one had heard of a, of a postpartum doula. I, you know, it wasn't a thing. And then just in January this year, I published my, um, my second book, which is called Newborn Mothers. And it, um, it was on the, it actually got to third on the Australian Amazon bestseller list, which was awesome. But it also was on the, um, or first on the pregnancy and childbirth. So there's a category on Amazon called pregnancy and childbirth. There's no mothering in that. There's no postpartum section. But I was really happy to see that on that first page of books, there were also at the same time as mine, four other postpartum books that are all fairly new in the last couple of years. And all of them were on that pregnancy and childbirth bestseller list. So I was like, oh, it's coming. It's happening. Yeah, people want to know. People want to know. Yeah. It. It's exciting. Yeah. Well, I think in the vein of sort of looking at how our, our culture has, has come to this place, how can we work with our, our cultures and our villages and our families and communities, um, our, you know, close knit communities and our wider communities um, for families to begin to set up support networks for themselves as they're entering the sacred postpartum window? Well, I think the first thing is what we've kind of already touched on, but is overcoming that shame um, and overcoming the idea that independence is the goal. Um, It's really not, you know, and I even um, talk a little bit about how I feel some discomfort around the word self-care because it still implies that you should be caring for yourself. And if you're not looking after yourself, that's your fault. Um, you know, rather than leaning into community and asking for help and, and giving and receiving and connection. And that's ultimately what we're really missing. But unless we can kind of get that mind shift, it, that mind shift first, we won't even see the village that's in front of our eyes. Because a lot of women, once they do really, really make that shift, that paradigm shift from feeling like, you know, that they have to do everything alone, um, to realizing that that actually it's so much more enjoyable and much more feminine and exactly what our world needs right now for us to do things together. Um, and then they actually start to go, oh, you know, there were people around me all along and I was saying no, I was rejecting them, you know, and I didn't, I didn't realize I thought I didn't have a village, you know. So, you know, I think really the first thing and it's not a complete village. I mean, even once you've had that realization, there's still a lot of work to do, but you can't do any of the work until you've really looked into the stories that you've been raised with about why, um, you know, are you really meant to do this alone or, or not? You know, that's ultimately the question. If you can overcome that, then you can find your village. Right. Or just because your, your mom did it with very little help or your friends did it with very little help, does that mean that you therefore have to pull yourself up and make it happen. Um, Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And it's difficult because, you know, the patriarchy isn't about hating men and it's not even necessarily men, but it's too much of the masculine and women can be upholding the patriarchy. So often if a woman is a victim of the patriarchy and isn't supported in her own postpartum, then she'll perhaps Sometimes that leads people to then want to support other women, but for some other women that leads them to want to go, well, I did it on my own and you should too. Um, You know, so it's, it, it can be really difficult when that is around you. Um, But as well, I think what we really need to keep in mind is the long, long history of humans, not just the last few generations of, um, of weird humans, you know, like our cultures are very strange place right now anthropologically biologically this is not what we were designed to do it's not what we've done for hundreds of thousands of years so you know if we can try and zoom out and see the bigger picture we'll see that that actually you know it's normal for a baby and people are shocked when I say that but it's normal for a baby to have around eight uh, and maybe even up to 15 different adult carers every single day on a daily basis. Mm. That's what's normal. And we are the strange ones. <laughs> yeah, I can't even imagine. I can't even, and I felt fairly supported. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. It makes you think, it really makes you think like, 
we obviously can't do that right here, right now. I mean, there'd be very few people listening to this who actually have the opportunity of eight, you know, trusted, close adults who could tend to their child on a daily basis. But what it does make you do is realise, well, no wonder I can't keep up. No wonder I'm feeling stretched in 30 different directions, you know. Right. It's not meant to be like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's such an interesting conversation. Thank you so much for your insights about this. Oh, my pleasure. You know, just the, the whole profession of um, caregiving, obviously, now that, you know, our culture is the way it is and families don't have 15 other, you know, community members that are a close access to help support them when their babies arrive into the world, we, we have to hire doulas, we have to hire people to come in and give us the support that is not present naturally. Mm -hmm. So we have this whole profession of, of postpartum doulas and among, you know, many other people in the caregiving profession, but specifically for this window of time we're talking about, we have the postpartum caregivers or doulas. And I would love to talk a little bit about like that profession um, itself. And um, I mean, obviously it's humongously important we love it. We recognize that those caregivers have a place that is vital in our culture as it is right now, but it can often be a really difficult profession to have. And I wonder if mm. you'd be willing to speak about, about it, the profession itself and how we can. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's an interesting point that you make that, you know, traditionally this care would have been provided by um, communities, by the family. And it's true but I think there was always there was always doulas. There always always would have been midwives, witches, healers. There always would have been that woman in every village who was there for those big occasions in your in your life, you know. And you know, in the interviews I've done with people all over the world, um, in in England they were responsible for the birth and the postpartum, but they were also responsible for laying out the dead. And then depending on their, um, their religion, that some of them did abortions as well, um, you know, and, and family planning. And then in Malaysia, uh, a woman I was interviewing, she just said that it's a very well-paid job in Malaysia to be a, um, a, they call them confinement ladies. So even though in Malaysia they have, they still currently have this, um, this support from their families, they also have paid um, support. So I think it's actually one of the oldest professions on earth, you know. I think it's probably one of the, um, the original jobs um, that people would have been paid for. And even before the advent of money, they would have been paid in, in gifts and trades and food and that kind of thing. They would have been cared for. So, you know, and I'm not saying that the family can't do it, but in our culture, the family actually doesn't know what to do anymore, um, which isn't true everywhere. So in our culture, if you want that kind of care, you almost definitely have to pay for it, which is, um, you know, which is sad. That should be something that the community all rallies behind. And often I put it like this, that if, you know, like when, when you get married in our culture, it's quite normal for the parents of the, traditionally the bride, but these days probably either gender um, or parents will put money up for that wedding because it's considered a really important community occasion and that's what really should happen around birth is that you know like ultimately it would be like the social responsibility that that they um that woman gets the care she needs so it's a difficult it's a difficult thing but i also want to just point out that it's okay to get paid and probably quite normal and and very ancient to get paid for that work but here we are in the patriarchy and in more recent human history Women have not been allowed to have bank accounts. Women have not been allowed to own property. Women haven't had um, pockets for their coins, you know, to hold their belongings in, um, you know, and that lack of women's rights means that women's work, all women's work is massively devalued and underpaid. And that goes from being a doula to being a childcare worker. Um, you know, and even if you work in a man's profession, you'll still get paid less than a man. Um, so it's actually a radical act against the patriarchy to pay women for women's work. That's one of the most kind of powerful things I think we can do to disrupt um, this system. So, you know, if, if anyone moving into this profession is feeling guilty about asking for money for this kind of work, 
A, it's as old as the hills and B, if you, we're going to break the patriarchy, then we need to get paid. Right. I love that so much. Really recognizing, because I think as caregivers, it is, it uh, can feel very uncomfortable to charge a living wage for our services. And this is a question that so many students have coming through our program um, is, is around setting up their practice and what they should charge. And while that is uh, not a blanket answer, you know, um, in terms of this is the answer to that question, I think that um, talking about it as this radical action of social change on a broader level, that perhaps we all have a responsibility for charging what is right for the work that we're doing um, to take care of us as the caregivers and therefore start to shift patterns in society that run very deep. I think so, yeah. And, you know, some people are very fortunate that they've inherited money or their husbands are rich or for whatever reason they can afford to do it for free or for very cheap. And that's, you know, that's so lucky for them. I wish I was in that position. <laughs> um, you know, how great. But for most of us, for 99% of us, if we don't earn money from this work, we will not be able to do this work. We will have to go back to, you know, some other office job, which isn't going to be so meaningful. It's not going to be our calling. And it's not going to be changing the way that society thinks about women and mothers and work and caring and kindness, you know. So, yeah, you know, if people are feeling like, hesitant about how could I possibly charge for a job that I love so much mm. also how could you possibly not charge for a job that is so valuable possibly the most valuable work we could ever do as humans is caring for mothers and babies at that you know that critical transition in their lives it sets them up for their entire lives and it changes the way that communities work and that people and relationships and you know connection and all of that kind of thing it's it's just it's so critical to me that I think it's like ridiculous that we could think that it shouldn't be charged, you know, that it should be free. <laughs> right, right. It's another one of those things that we just have to start wrapping our head around it in a different way, such as the difficult thing of asking for help when you need it and not feeling like yeah. you do it yourself. It's another one. Like I feel uncomfortable These, uh... with this, but I have to work on this process so that I can look at it differently and therefore start to move things in a better direction for everybody. Yeah. And these are all the stories that the patriarchy uses to keep us oppressed. You know, like the patriarchy doesn't oppress us anymore with, you know, there's not most places like the, where, where you and I will be having an audience, you know, in America, in, in Australia, in England, in Europe, that most of those places don't have laws that discriminate against women anymore. You know, like women can vote, women can have bank accounts, women can own property, women can vote. Did I say that one? Can get divorces, all of those kind of things. But the thing that's still upholding the patriarchy is the stories. It's the beliefs that they've sold us about how we should act, feel, look, be, you know, and, and those are the, that's going to be the last thing that we get rid of. Yeah. Yeah. It's a tough one because you really have to die. It's really hard. <laughs> it's the hardest. <laughs> the hardest, but perhaps the most meaningful. I find that the hardest things are the ones that are the most important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's such a great discussion. Um, so another thing that I really am excited to talk to you about and sort of help foster this discussion that's happening on a wider level around yoga, around Ayurveda, around, um, you know, basically any, any uh, Westerners who work with other traditions that are not from a culture that is our own background and the responsibilities that we have to honor and uphold those traditions and not exploit it or, or uh, appropriate it in ways that are damaging um, and I wanted to, to open up the discussion with you on how you sort of look at bringing Ayurveda and postpartum and the other cultures that you draw from, um, how you look at cultural appropriation. Yeah, it's a, such a difficult topic. And I can only really talk, obviously, from my own personal experience. And everyone's going to have different views on such a big, complicated topic as this. But 
Um, I think the biggest work that I've personally done to feel um, sort of comfortable in this space is, is actually exploring my own cultural um, background, my own ancestry. Because I think when a lot of European um, women, you know, ancestry women come to this work, we often do think, oh, they do that in China, they do that in India. And that's why we start to think, oh, well, I have to do henna or I have to do, you know, this particular practice or that particular thing, that ritual or, you know, whatever. We start to kind of take things from other people's cultures. But what we don't realise is that we have these things in our own lineage as well. Um, you know, so if anyone watching this can find an elder, and it doesn't have to be someone related to you, but if you can find elders, you know, because this is so recent, really, it's so recent. And I, I've interviewed, um, you know, women who are living, who have memory of how things should be, you know, they, they you know, because if you think about it, a woman now who's maybe a grandmother, if she can remember her own grandmother having a baby, you know, like, you know, or aunts or whatever from back then, you're actually reaching back quite a few generations and you can actually learn and um, a lot of stuff that's been lost, say, in the last 100 years, they might still know that stuff. So, you know, I think the more that we can realise that this, um, these traditions are universal and they're, you know, so inherently human, um, and if we can access our own rather than taking from others, I think then um, we can also allow space for, for all voices and, and all variations on these kinds of universal truths. It's so true. And I think that's so, um, so beautiful to really witness how, how human, I know you've talked a couple times in this interview about how it's, it's human understanding of what the needs are and what to do. It's just expressed slightly differently in different cultures. Um, and I think recognizing that is so, uh, validating and empowering, um, on just a universal level in terms of recognizing that we're all connected in this situation. Um, I do think that it's so humbling to really be able to start speaking from what is true for our own path, our own personal path and the, the cultures that we come from, but also the experiences that we have in our own life and really speaking to that and focusing on that um, rather than um, being a mouthpiece for somebody else. Like I'm not a representative for, um, you know, somebody from this culture. I'm speaking and I'm acknowledging that this is my path and this is what I know and here is what I think about that. Um, and I think we can all mm, yeah. really speak in the most powerful, clear way when we really are speaking from our own path rather than mm -hmm. from another's. And that doesn't mean yeah. that another culture isn't going to come in and resonate and really help us thinking further about how we understand the world. I think all of the teachings of Ayurveda, which most specifically um, is a background of, of mine in terms of education. So all that Ayurvedic education is sort of melded with my own perspectives and my own experience personally. Um, so yeah, it's, it is a very difficult topic, um, but I think the one, like one that the more we talk about it, the more clarity and understanding we have about it. Yeah, I think it is. It's really tricky. And the other thing you mentioned there, which I think is really important is, is acknowledgement is really acknowledging where did we learn this from and, and who does this really belong to? Um, you know, and I think that's really critical. I think when it gets really damaging is when things are taken out of context and, you know, people don't really know who, you know, who and where and what the meaning is. One really strong example that is very frustrating is the, um, the term mother blessing rather than blessing way. So, you know, and we've known for a long time now that blessing way is an inappropriate term and yet people still use it a lot. And I find that must be, you know, for, for, so the people who that culture is disrespecting, that must be so hurtful when that happens again and again and again. And they've mm -hmm. specifically said, please don't use the term blessing way. And, and everyone's still using the term blessing way. I mean, that's just so, so difficult. So I think if someone ever, you know, 
does say to you that's, that that's not cool, then I think we really need to listen and be okay with having those brave conversations. Absolutely. It's, I think it's, um, it's an ability to be always learning and always taking yeah. advice and being ready to hear it and, and yeah. learning from it. Yeah. 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 Um, so Julia, you have a really specific um, area of, of focus in your program that is unlike any that I've ever encountered. And I'm very excited to talk to you about um, your neuroscience background and your understanding and exploration of, of the brain and how the brain is affected and changes for birthers as they bring babies into the world. Um, and also for partners and families and, and how our fast paced culture can really affect the brain and what that does to a newborn mother. Um, I'd love for you to speak about that. Yeah. So first of all, I will say I'm not a scientist at all. <laughs> Just someone who's very, very passionate. I have studied um, at the Neuroscience Academy. Um, I've read about a million books and I've interviewed loads of scientists and, you know, tried to really do my best without a science brain to understand this kind of stuff. Um, but it is very new and it's, it's still, you know, it's still like there's still so many gaps in what we know. But what we do know is that there's an algorithm that can tell with 100% accuracy just from looking at a brain scan, whether this is the brain of a pregnant, um, someone who's experienced a pregnancy or someone who's never been pregnant. So that's it. All it takes is you experiencing a pregnancy, even if you don't even have a live birth or you maybe give the baby to someone else. Um, if you need, don't raise that baby, um, your brain has already changed enough that 100% of the time, a computer can tell that. Um, so that just gives you some idea, you know, like, and this is kind of the next wave of feminism, I think, is actually embracing that we are in these small ways different. Obviously, men and women are more, uh, we have more in common than what sets us apart. But what does set us apart is really this ability to, um, to create new life. You know, this is a, this is a totally unique feminine thing. Um, and our brain's do change drastically in ways that that men and and even women who don't have babies um, will never experience. Um, you know, so I think that's really like blew my mind when I learned about that. And that, you know, I could talk about that for hours. But but the basis of the changes, the two main changes, one of them I call loving, and the other one I call learning. And loving is really to do with oxytocin, which most most people are familiar with oxytocin in the role of birth. But then they, um, it stops there, you know, most of knowledge, our, our knowledge of biology and women and, and feminism, it's kind of like, yeah, then you have a baby and you go back to normal. But no, that's not true. Your oxytocin levels are high for months and possibly even years afterwards, especially if you breastfeed for an extended amount of time. Um, so much so to the point where it actually will rewire your brain um, forever. You actually grow oxytocin receptors in your breasts, in your uterus. You get new oxytocin receptors in your brain. Um, you know, these things that just literally didn't exist before. Um, so those are all the loving changes. That's what helps us bond, become more empathetic, better at um, uh, reading nonverbal cues. You know, there's so many things that are related to those massive oxytocin changes. And then on the other side, we also have something um, uh, called uh, increased plasticity, neuroplasticity. And way back in the old days, people used to think, scientists used to think that our brains were uh, static. You know, you were born with the brain and that was it for life. Um, and we now know, obviously, that that's not true. But the reason we know that's not true is from studying um, uh, pregnancy. So when you are pregnant, then your brain plasticity increases um, massively. There's a couple of other times in life when your brain plasticity increases a lot, um, which are more well known about, funnily enough. So obviously babies have high brain plasticity and teenagers have high brain plasticity. But most people don't know that a mother, a new mother has um, high brain plasticity as well. And it makes sense that that's because we're learning so much new stuff. We are learning, 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 and we're preparing for our role for the next 
stage in our life where our information might not be useful anymore and we're having to kind of rewrite what, um, what is relevant, what's important, what's valuable for our new um, job. So the combination of those two things is quite mind blowing and no wonder women feel a bit overwhelmed <laughs> when they're having a baby and no wonder our personality changes so much that we kind of go, oh, I don't even know who I am anymore. <laughs> Right. It's so true. Um, really, it's like one of the biggest transitions ever in your life. So it makes complete 100% sense that our brains are going through um, taking on whole new characteristics. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, if we could just be a little bit easier on ourselves, just a bit kinder to ourselves as we're going through these massive changes, I often... Um, we'll liken it to upgrading the operating system of your computer. So, you know, when you upgrade your operating system, it's really annoying because at first you can't, they're like the, you know, keyboard controls might have changed and you can't find where things are in the menu anymore and the buttons look different. And, you know, the first few days after the change, you were like, ah, oh, everything's taking longer. I can't figure out how to do it anymore. I wish I could just go back to the old way. But then after a while, you get used to it and you realize that actually the new way is better for the job that you're doing now, you know, because when you're a mother, you need different skills. Um, but because we live in this world that just doesn't value these feminine skills, we often, mothers will get stuck trying to go back to the old way. They're trying constantly to go back to the old normal um, rather than embracing a new kind of more feminine, um, mothering, nurturing you know, that's why we cry at the news, you know, and that's why we feel like, you know, all the world's children are our children, you know, and, and, and it gets like written off as being like, oh, emotional women. It's like, no, actually, that is our true power. That is, that is ultimately what it means to be, uh, you know, a mother. That's, that's the whole point. Right. It's really beautiful. And I think, um, by having an explanation for why we feel different, it helps people integrate and be more gentle and forgiving with themselves rather than what the heck is wrong with me? I'm so different. I'm scared because I don't understand this new experience. When you understand the explanation why, it's easier to integrate and then it's easier yeah. to forgive yourself. Just be like, oh, I think so. This is happening, and this is great, and this is how it's supposed to be. I'm just fine. Yeah, that's right. And if you have those days where things are a bit fuzzy, or you're a bit forgetful, or you're a bit overwhelmed, or a bit scattered, or whatever, you know, you can just go, "That's all right. I'm just upgrading my operating system right now." <laughs> <laughs> that's perfect. I love it. Well, Julia, I just, um, I am so grateful to you for spending this time with me. And do you have any, anything else that you wanted to share or talk about before we, before we close? Uh, not really. Just if anyone is interested in um, reading my books or studying my courses, you can go to newbornmothers.com. Um, and yeah, that's, that's really it. I, I, you know, I really love this work. Obviously I'm, you know, incredibly passionate and obsessed um, with all things postpartum. So thank you for having me on and, and letting me talk about my, my uh, special interests. <laughs> sure. I feel like we could talk all day about it, but um, so I'm sure there'll be more and thank yes. you. Yes. And um, so again, this has been Julia Jones of Newborn Mothers and I'm Christine Eck of the Center for Sacred Window Studies. And thank you so much for listening. Thank you.